Welcome to the Green Team Speaks To, the podcast for the Paulson Institute's Green Finance Center. Hello, I'm Felicia Wu, Director at the Paulson Institute, and today I'll be speaking with Fiona Stewart, Lead Financial Sector Specialist at the World Bank in their Global Capital Markets Non-Bank Financial Institutions Group. She is leading important research on cutting edge topics and has extensive institutional finance experience from her time at the OECD and in the pension fund industry. Fiona, welcome to the Green Team Speaks To podcast. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you today. You are doing fantastic work on sustainability and ESG, which are continuing to climb on global agendas and attracting much needed attention among various stakeholder groups. We have lots to get to today. Absolutely. Great to talk to you. And I'm a big fan of the work that the Paulson Group are doing as well, Felicia. Thank you so much for the mention. So I, it, let's let's start off kind of with one of the hottest topics in the sustainability space, which is biodiversity. And it is, it's just zoomed to the top of agendas in the span of about two to three years. Uh, it doesn't sound like that fast, but compared to green finance, that took about 10 years. It's you know lightning speed in a way. Um, so at the Paulson Institute, we're you're keenly interested in advancing the conversation around biodiversity uh, in tandem with the need to address climate challenges. So naturally, starting off here, um, what you, you've you been doing work on this topic. So I'd like to just ask you for your uh, quick thoughts on the twin crises we have at hand and, you know, what would be your top three um, key messages or priority areas to be focusing on? No, it's, I agree with you. It's super interesting how quickly, and I think actually the report that that, that you guys did and the, the numbers that you came out with, it seems five minutes ago, but what, two, a couple of years ago now, I think was one of the early reports that got a lot of attention actually for this on this topic that as the World Bank as well, we've been working on. And um, I, lo- I love those Google searches you have of words. And I saw one the other day, and as you say, climate's been building and then it just boom, in the last two years, you can see the whole biodiversity and natural capital is really starting to catch up, which is super exciting. Mm-hmm. So what I like to say is uh, you and I'm sure others have heard me say that, you know, nature is the new climate, basically. Um, and I think there's I would say there's two things I think we can really um, differentiate and learn from the, the, the climate world for biodiversity and nature. Um, one we can learn from and one I think is very different. So on what's different, we talk a lot about greening finance and financing green. I'm sure you've heard that adage a lot, the risk side and then the opportunity side. Right. And I think nature's fundamentally quite different from climate. So on the climate side, we saw a lot of on the financing green was where we really started to see um, momentum as um, financing of renewables, et cetera, um, the mitigation side um, that really started to take off. And we know how to do that in finance. That's a new business area. You know, we know how to use subsidies and guarantees and get to scale. And we've seen that in solar, et cetera, and a lot more to do, but it was really a lot of momentum on the financing green. And then the risk side, I think the greening finance has has been catching up with climate. I actually think with nature, it's gonna be the other way around. So where we're actually seeing quite a lot of momentum, I think is on the greening finance on the risk side. And there's a lot we can learn from the climate world. And that's why I think things are moving quite quickly in biodiversity and, and, and natural capital, whether it's the sort of the, the risk assessments and stress testing in the banking sector, whether it's the reporting, um, whether it's the engagement tools, um, we're starting to be able to build biodiversity and, and nature loss risks alongside the climate. And we realize that they are interconnected. Um, we need the targets out of Aichi, we need more data, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we're seeing quite good um, momentum coming through quite quickly on the greening finance. The financing green side is, is it's hard with nature because, because of its nature, because it, it's, it's smaller scale. You're often dealing with public goods, getting private finance in there. It's tricky. Lots of interesting things are happening around whether it's carbon markets, whether it's natural capital accountings and, and starting to get investment opportunities coming through. But there, I think, is where I think there's difference and where I think we still need to have more work. But it's definitely things are moving, moving very fast. And it's very encouraging coming up to the CBD and the biodiversity COP later in the year. Indeed, it is. It is interesting and an exciting time. You've done a report called Nature Action 100 for you know, targeting investor engagement for biodiversity. You know, what, what is that if folks don't know? Uh, and is there an overlap with the Climate Action 100? Uh, what have the, the highlights been so far on that side of work for you guys? And what's on the horizon for that initiative? 
yes, so very much, a, as you say, a work in progress. And mm. I think it's this is part of the greening the financial sector overall. So we need as many tools as we can to make sure capital is moving towards projects, companies, countries that are putting in place really sustainable practices and, and away from those that are not putting in practices and projects that, that help um, nature protection. And what the, the Climate 100, Action 100 group did was they are a group of investors that came together and they identified originally, well, came up to the 100 companies in the world that had the most um, GHG emissions and decided as investors, as asset owners, as the shareholders of those companies, they have a lot of power and a lot of voice to try and change that corporate behavior. So building mm -hmm. on the sort of decades of really good corporate governance work. And they really targeted those countries, those companies to try and get changes in the corporate action to really reduce their GHG emissions. The idea is to have a parallel um, uh, initiative for nature. So have a Nature Action 100 group and the Biodiversity Pledge, which is a group of investors who again have come together to really put um, nature and biodiversity at the heart of their investment practices. They've, they've, um, they're thinking around launching again a similar list, a similar target list to the climate list for nature. Obviously, a lot of food companies, a lot of um, ag companies, et cetera, will be on there. But they're working on a methodology at the moment for what those companies would be, who to target. And then together, what's the best, again, learning from the corporate governance world, learning from the climate world, what's the best ways of engagement with companies, which they are shareholders in, to try and ensure that those you know, sustainable um, you know, circular economy, et cetera, practices that really support nature and biodiversity are put in place. So still a work in progress and, and I think mm. very interesting. In parallel to that, I would say we're also doing work at the bank here at the World Bank on sovereign engagement, because we do a lot of work on ESG, environmental social governance, on the sovereign bond asset class. As I'm sure you know, obviously, uh, all this world ESG started with equities, moved to sort of corporate bonds, but um, sovereign bonds, sovereign debt is the biggest um, part of many um, portfolios, uh, asset institutional investor portfolios, particularly in emerging markets. What does this ESG creature mean for sovereign debt is a bit of a question that people have been asking. So we've been doing a lot of work on that, including how is it, would investors engage with a country? Investors are used to engaging with companies, but how do you invest with a, um, engage with a country? Mm -hmm. So we've been doing some work, for example, on you know, ESG reporting frameworks for countries, for sovereign debt um, offices, as they engage with investors, they're increasingly being asked all these questions about ESG. How should they engage? What sort of information should they provide? Do they need a TCFD-like framework for sovereigns? So again, on the sort of engagement um, side of things, I think that's very interesting, um, sort of leading edge that we'll see more work on, I think, coming out this year. Uh, yes, and actually, I think that was one of my later questions, uh, you know, talking about the sovereign debt potentials and challenges, really expand a little bit more on the, you know, sovereign sustainability reporting practices um, as with regard to nature and where your work has been this moment. And what do you expect coming out of this year with a lot of the negotiations in the lead up to the second half of CBD and the growth of this kind of biodiversity investment angle from investors? So I think, um, as I say, there's two things. One is the sort of engagement angle, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be a lot more sort of engaging with, um, we've already seen groups of investors come together to engage on um, deforestation, for example, or coming together on topics like ocean plastics and things. But particularly sort of on the, on the deforestation, there's a lot of um, engagement groups um, that are looking to uh, talk directly to sovereigns as well as corporates, which I think is a very interesting development. And I think we'll see more of that going forward. And as the international sustainability reporting framework is coming together for corporates, a very important development for all of us in the sustainability world, the ISSB, the Sustainability Standards Board that's been put together to come out with those for corporate reporting. I think uh, we can also see that the some of the public sector reporting, I think, will be moving in this direction as well. So what will the structures be for that? How do we make sure that countries with you know, smaller ministries of finance, less capacity, small debt management offices, making sure they have templates and can help them do that in a way that's as, as easy as possible without overwhelming them, but really right. helps to get the information that investors are looking for and helps them tell their story. The issue in the financial markets at the moment is a lot of the risk of climate, a lot of the risk of nature loss 
is being um, is being increasingly recognized. But the asset side is not the natural capital that mm-hmm. we all rely on to really um, defend against um, climate change. These sort of public global public goods, it's in emerging markets, but it's not being factored in by by markets as such. So these natural capital accounting, etc., how countries and debt offices communicate their assets, communicate how they're protecting them, I think will be very important for ensuring that capital goes to the areas, the countries, the corporates that really are defending these global public goods. So that sort of engagement, I think, is and, and reporting is, is, is interesting development on the sovereign side, again, following mm-hmm. from climate and following from the corporate sector. But then we're also working on instruments. So how you help direct the capital as well as the engagement side, how do you actually create investment instruments that direct capital towards these goals? And obviously, we've seen a lot of growth and there's a lot more to come in the green bond market blue bonds, sustainable bonds, but a lot of the green bond market is very exciting. We're seeing issuance coming out all the time from new countries, different regions. And that's a great way of getting um, investors into countries and and companies that they wouldn't necessarily have invested in before. But we're seeing a new set of investors coming to countries, Chile, for example, in some of their labeled bonds. Mm -hmm. They had a whole new set of investors who not invested in the vanilla corporate bonds of Chile but that actually came through these labelled bonds, through the green bonds, which is very encouraging. These things called sustainability-linked bonds. So not just the use of proceeds. So you say, this is what my green bond is going to be used for, these projects, et cetera. Right, but it right. actually changed the cost of capital based on indicators. So the issuer of the bond, whether it's a corporate or we hope eventually a, 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 a sovereign, will make um, targets, key performance indicators. If they meet them, then they'll get a change in the cost of capital. And I think that's a super interesting development. We're seeing big developments there in the corporate market. I think there's some coming in the sovereign world as well. And I think that's very interesting for starting to factor these, these, these issues, not just climate, but also nature, into the financial markets. I think they could be a super interesting instrument that we're seeing, I think, will be coming in 2022. So you, you've, you've just jumped into the kind of financing greens, as you were talking about earlier on, touching upon you know the, the sovereign issues of the blue sovereign bond issues and the sustainability link bonds. Are you seeing any, you've mentioned the opportunities, but what are some of the challenges that you may foresee in this space as it becomes more, more and more popular? So one of the challenges is that it's, it's, it is a bit of a, mind shift, a mindset shift, I think, for the debt management offices, because with a label bond or with one of these these KPI bonds, um, you have to think about a whole of government approach. So there has to be green budgeting or green project tagging, for example, behind um, any label bond with the KPI. You'll have to talk to other ministries to see, you know, what are you doing in terms of your reforestation targets, your NDC targets as a government as a whole. So it involves the debt offices, the ministries, the finance. It's a really a whole of government approach, which is quite new for these DMOs. And, and that can be quite challenging. I think we'll need support and capacity building and the World Bank and some of our other um, partners and colleagues at the IADB and elsewhere. We do a lot of work helping um, issuers of green bonds with the reporting, with the sort of budget tagging. You know, there's a lot of support out there, mm-hmm. um, but I think it's still quite a quite a mindset change for, for the debt offices. Right. Um, right. And then I should say that this is slightly separate from the debt restructuring. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a big and there's a lot of I have reams and teams of colleagues who are much more expert on this area than I am in terms of the debt restructuring agenda. But obviously, that's going to be challenging coming um, even more so with the global situation in the last week or so. But coming out of the covid situation post pandemic, a lot of sort of restructuring will be will be happening. Um, some of these instruments, you know, the debt for nature swaps, even potentially these um, sustainability linked bonds might be part of that, but they're not the whole of it at all. Um, we, we, I must accept that it's, you know, it's not, this is more about new debt or, rest- or, or, or rollover debt. The whole debt restructuring is a, is a very difficult and challenging area, I think, going forward. But we hope that sort of the nature and the climate agenda might be able to play at least part of that. Oh, interesting. I'm sure we can have a, just a, very long conversation on that specifically and and maybe we'll save that for another time but uh maybe i'll just continue with this conversation on the financing green aspect and and then you know aside from sustainability link bonds we've been hearing a lot about um you know just kind of different areas of kind of 
blue, green, green, blue finance instruments and innovations like um, the potential for nature markets and nature asset companies like the New York Stock Exchange has um, been proposing. Uh, are these things that you are, um, are hopeful for or you know, do you see a lot of uh, potential challenges with them as well? I think it's super interesting. Yes, I'm very interested in this idea of the natural um, capital yeah, companies. Yes, yeah, as are we. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really interesting idea. I think it. I think it um, needs some more um, thinking through, and 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 will obviously be great if we can see some pilots coming through. I know some mm-hmm. countries are looking at this. I, I think it's not particularly. I think the pieces of the jigsaw are there, but it's again, it's a mindset set shift mm-hmm. in that um, there's a lot of uh, you know very good conservation trusts have been set up, whether it's marine areas or conservation areas. We are getting um, the markets um, coming in with new revenue streams from um, carbon markets, from biodiversity credits are starting to come together. Um, and also the idea of the, the nature-based solutions, again, some sort of new revenue streams. If we can package these together and then think of these, as I say, the natural capital as an asset, as an intrinsic value, as well as these cash flow values, and think of it more as a as an asset rather than a, a conservation philanthropic grant, but more really, you're really investing in an asset that can really help us with these global public goods, these systemic risk management that these global public goods will play. I think that's super, super interesting. I think it is a mindset shift. Um, I hope we will see some really innovative um, projects and some really leading edge investors. Maybe it will be philanthropy, maybe it will be um, um, development banks such as ourselves or our partners, I think, involved in this to get these markets going. That's the, the role that we play. But I think a lot of the pieces of the jigsaw are there, but it will take a new way of thinking and really appreciating these global assets. Um, if we can create an instrument that allows that um, philosophical shift to then come through, I think that could be very game changing for markets, just like the KPI bonds starting to really value capital on the outcomes um, of protecting climate and, and nature, I think could be could be very fundamental shifts in the market, which um, exciting developments, I think, for 2022 and going forward. I definitely agree with you that it's uh, we're going to require for, for you know, the financial system to think green, think nature. It's going to it is a wholesale shift um, and it's transformational and it has to, you know, basically is a rethink of economies and economics as we know it um and and, you know the magnitude of global stakeholder buy-in will be significant um and so how how do you view the role of global institutions in this transition as lots of global action and governance will have to be led from these global institutions Uh, i think you mentioned maybe multi uh, multi multi-development banks are, are are part of the solution um you know, what about the UN, G20 type, the NGFS, are they key in this coalition to, to you know, kind of tackle climate and nature at the same time? And the, any strengths and weaknesses to consider for some of these kinds of types of organizations since you've, um, you know, your experiences in the OECD and at, at the World Bank obviously lend a lot of credence to thoughts here. Um, yeah, I think there's fantastic work going on at the um, at the sort of global architecture level, if you like, the standard setters. And as we said at the start, you know, I think it's amazing how quickly they're taking the nature and the biodiversity alongside the climate. I think there was a view, again, fairly recently that a lot of people were saying, and I totally um, respect that, you know, there's a lot of work still to do on climate. We shouldn't get distracted. We need to, you know, you know crack the climate nut before we move on to biodiversity or nature. But I think I think that's really changed. I think people realise how integrated they are and that we really look, need to look at them together. And as I said, we can use a lot of the tools that's been built for climate for the nature agenda. So mm-hmm. and I think that's you really see that in the sustainable finance working group over the G20 that nature's in there. The NGFS are about to come out with and are doing good work on biodiversity and nature. They've got a, some reports coming out. So I think it's really the coalition of finance ministers for climate that we provide the secretariat for here at the World Bank and I work with. Again, they're really interested and they wanted to talk to um, um, Das Gup- Des- the Dasgupta team when the Dasgupta report came out. You know, they've been mm-hmm. talking with um, TNFD. They really want to be kept up to date on nature. So I think there's a big appetite and understanding at this sort of global architecture level. And then what we do, the role of um, the, the World Bank and our partners is to really take those global standards and help 
imp implement them in, in emerging markets. And so we have a, a good, a strong role that when they're being set, when you're setting these standards, that the emerging markets views are taken into account and the voice is there and to make sure that the standards act as they can be a really useful hook to get capital to emerging markets. But you need to be very careful they're not set at such a high level or at a, at, in a way that's not appropriate for more developing markets and act as a, a hurdle rather than a hook. So mm -hmm. we, we have play a very important role there. And then once the standards are set, we can help implement them into, into the emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we've done some um, risk, uh, nature risk uh, assessments for um, central banks in, in Malaysia recently. We were working with them, very good work out of the central bank in Malaysia, which they'll be coming out with shortly, doing a really innovative nature stress test for their banking system, given they're such a natural capital rich country. It's so important for them. And then uh, reporting, again, working on a lot of sort of ESG reporting in emerging markets making sure that the frameworks they're building for their own corporates, institutional investors, banking reporting, I've been working in countries like Nepal, for example, that the frameworks they create will be very much aligned with the international standards as they come through and as they develop. So I think there's really good leadership coming out of the international organizations. We need to be very careful and, and really make sure that they think globally and that they what they're doing is really able to be proportionally and appropriately applied globally mm -hmm. and then as I say a lot of hand holding, hand holding and that's a sort of bread and butter work to make sure it gets rolled out in our client countries. Lots of work ahead for you. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well we're here to support um, in, in any capacity um, but um, I just want to close with a softball I think hopefully. Um, what are some of the ways that you live a green or sustainable life? Well, I, I do live in the city. I live here in Washington, D.C., so I don't have a car, which I think is one sort of green contribution. But I think it's probably right. also a social responsibility because I'm a very, very bad driver. So I think it might be a social <laughs> responsibility as much as a green. Um, and then I think like a lot of people, I'm, I'm eating a lot less meat. I think like a lot mm -hmm. of people making the shift just because the, the plant based um, 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 alternatives are so good. They're getting better and better. So I Indeed think like they are being much, uh, much less of a meat eater as well. Um, the challenge I have is flying. I have my my family and, and friends are in other countries, so that's uh, that's something I haven't been doing in the last two years. But I I will be doing a bit more, I think, in the next uh, in the next year coming. Um, hopefully going forward. But that's uh, that's my challenge on the on the on the green side. But the um, the driving one is less of a challenge for me, given I think <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a very reluctant driver in the first place. Well, hopefully we see some breakthroughs for the sustainable aviation fuel side, right? Um, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, Fiona, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for joining us on Green Team Speaks To. To listen to more episodes and learn more about the Paulson Institute's work in green finance, please visit us at paulsoninstitute.org. See you next time.